Hello, Internet. Welcome to episode 47 of the Stanford MLC seminar series. Uh, my name is Dan. Today, I'm joined by Fyodor, Piero, and our guest, Zane Asgar. So um, as, as always, we'll be having a 30-minute talk followed by a 30-minute podcast discussion where you, the live audience, can uh, leave questions in the YouTube chat and we'll get them over to Zane. Um, before we get started, remember to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Uh, you can hit the little bell icon to get notified when we go live. A little bit about Zane and about the talk today. So Zane is, uh, was a CEO and co-founder of Pixie, which has uh, since been acquired by New Relic. Um, he's also this year a adjunct professor of, of computer science at Stanford and is actually teaching a, a class on uh, embedded machine learning. Um, and we, we had a little discussion about that in, in the pre-show um, for, for those of you that were here. Um, so today, Zane is going to be talking about uh, data science for infrastructure using Pixie. So we're all very excited to hear from him. Um, so with that, you know, Zane, take it away. Thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, so as Dan mentioned today, I'm going to talk about data science for infrastructure uh, using Pixie. Uh, for context, Pixie is a uh, cloud native sandbox project that focuses on uh, monitoring Kubernetes. Um, and we specifically use eBPF to automatically instrument code and we'll have an entire data system to work with, uh, work with the data that we generate. So I'll kind of walk through the pieces of, of how you, know, you would do data science using this platform uh, and also what we're excited about. So. Um, I think Dan gave you a background, but uh, quick note again, uh, I'm Zane, uh, I'm the general manager at, I'm a general manager at New Relic who's focused on Pixie and uh, open source. So I generally look uh, over the foundation open source projects. Um, also a CNCF board member and an adjunct professor. Um, I used to be the co-founder and CEO of Pixie. And then I was in Google research before working on machine learning and um, at Trifacta working on data system stuff. So, Without further ado, we can start walking through um, what we think. So when we start thinking about um, data, data science for infrastructure, um, we really see system and application observability as a data problem. Um, you know, my background, um, I started off as a hardware operation, but switched over to working on machine learning and data pretty early in my career. And I have a lot of experience working in, in data systems. So one of the things that you know, we've noticed we're here uh, in this particular space is that it's easy for machines to generate you know, gigabytes of data per second, um, mostly because you, know, you can instrument your application and get tons of, tons of information very quickly. Um, it is, however, pretty hard to get complete coverage of your application, especially in distributed environments where you may or may not control um, all the code and everything that's deployed. And this is certainly the case for uh, distributed orchestration systems like Kubernetes. And you know, in particular, I think it's hard to make sure that this data is actually relevant. And then it's also hard to make sure you can distill this data into something that's usable. So with that, we wanted to apply some of the learnings we had in the data space and actually apply it to the machine data space and the application observability space and, and build a system that can solve some of these problems. So the first thing is you know, collecting the right data and enough of the data is half the battle. Uh, the other thing we learned is that getting simple models and relevant data usually outperforms having lots of complex models on a skewed or incomplete data set. This is not something I need to tell anyone here, but you know, this, is, this is a high level, high level learning. And you know, in particular, it's also important to be able to audit and inspect your data pipelines. Things change, you wanna know what you did, why certain decisions were made and be able to audit and document this. So how do we do data-driven automation and what problems need to get solved? So just to kind of summarize this, the first step is to gather the raw data. And most of our time is spent here to get the variety in depth. Then we want to transform the data into a signal. Um, and typically, you know, I'm in the machine learning community now, but we tend to spend a very disproportionate emphasis in this area of how do we actually get signal out of the data. Um, and you know, a lot of times it can even be something simple, uh, including rule sets or statistical models. And then we wanna do something based on the signal. This could be something like setting up an alert that gives you a Slack message, you know, setting off a page, um, or be able to actually control Kubernetes itself. And we'll actually see that in one of the demos uh, later in this talk. Um, and of course, like this isn't really a one-way process. Um, most of us who have worked on data systems know that this is kind of an iterative cycle that continues on, on forever. <clears throat> 
Um, so specifically in the application space, I wanted to give some examples of what each of these boxes look like. Uh, the first box could be something like logs. It could be application metrics, like how many requests per second are happening, how much time is being spent in functions, um, or it could be things like request bodies and what's actually being sent over the network. Uh, the signals could be you know, aggregates, that could be things like anomaly detection or machine learning models. And finally, uh, I think I already alluded to this, if I wanna ping Slack, create Jira tickets, scale your deployments. Uh, there are a lot more things you could do and I'm not gonna, it's not an exhaustive list, and we don't need to walk through every single one of them. So overall, you know, we, when we started off a couple of years ago to build Pixie uh, back in 2018, we actually wanted to solve these problems or at least take a stab at solving some of these problems. Um, so we built Pixie um, with kind of three things in mind. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of go through the surface area of what all of these things mean. Um, but, you know, we, we have pretty extensive blogs and documentation on, on how this stuff works. So the first one is auto telemetry using eBPF. Um, and don't worry if you don't know what eBPF is, we'll get into it in a second. Um, everything is scriptable and API driven, and we want it to be a Kubernetes native system, which means that we can run and understand Kubernetes and in, inside of our, our, our system. Um, and the other thing I wanted to state over here is, uh, this isn't meant to be any kind of a product or a promotional pitch. Um, we are a cloud native sandbox project, which means that everything is open source, um, and available on GitHub as part of a foundation, uh, which is a, a cloud native computing foundation. Uh, which is a part of the Linux Foundation, if uh, if you're not familiar with that. Okay, so with that, I'll kind of talk about the high-level architecture of Pixie. Um, so this is like a very high-level overview of how Pixie works. Um, at the highest layer of the stack, you have the user interface, uh, which could be our, our web UI, CLI, or API. Uh, we have a cloud system, which you can self-host, um, that finally talks to your cluster. Uh, I guess I'm missing a box around this bottom part, but the bottom part runs entirely within the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and the way we think about Pixie is ultimately it's an edge-based observability system where we not only capture the data, but we also store the data on the nodes. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of walk backwards. I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, but on the right side over here, you can see we started the Linux kernel. Uh, we have this thing called Sterling, which is our data collector. Uh, we pipe the data into a set of tables uh, which actually very much resemble data frames. And then we have a query engine that is distributed. So part of the query engine sits on the PEM and part of the query engine sits on a set of nodes we call the collectors, uh, which basically have access to the data and metadata associated with the cluster. So with this system, we could basically get scripts, figure out where and how to execute them, and then be able to basically collect and process data and move data around. Um, I don't wanna go into like too many details as a you know, pretty short talk, uh, but that's kind of like the high level overview of how Pixie works. And um, I'll kind of jump into you know, a couple of the steps just to give, give a little bit more insight into how some of the stuff is structured. Uh, but part of what we wanted to do is that once we start connecting the, the Linux kernel and using eBPF, we can get this entire like fire hose of data and we needed to make the most efficient system to be able to process it without introducing significant CPU memory or network load on the machine. So part of our decision process was to creep a lot of the data local until we decide that we want to sample or move it away, uh, but also make it all available for short-term querying. So the entire system was built with this premise that we can allow you to do lots and lots of debugging uh, with real-time data or data spanning the last 24 hours. Um, but then for longer term storage, you would use something else. Okay, so with that, let me walk through some of the, the high level, you know, or the three steps we talked about, the Kubernetes native, scriptability, and eBPF. So Kubernetes native is a, the simplest of these things, right? Where uh, we make all the Kubernetes entities, um, and if you don't know about Kubernetes entities, it's not that important, but um, it's, it's kind of the idea is that our system understands everything that Kubernetes works with, things like pods and services and uh, deployments and nodes, and all the data is actually stored within your cluster and the edge nodes themselves. So auto telemetry using eBPF, this allows us to capture high level application data with relatively low overhead. And we'll dive into the details of this in a second. And the last thing is the API driven scriptability and 100% scriptable. So we wanna keep everything as code, everything as a script and give you access to the API, 
and they can easily integrate with other, other tools. So the question you might be asking is, how do you actually capture data without manually instrumenting it? Um, you know, there, there are a couple of ways people have gone about this in the past. The first one is, well, you add manual instrumentation wherever you want to capture a request, you send it off to some API and you capture the data. Uh, the other option is to intercept runtime. So if you're running something on Python, you can essentially monkey patch all the requests to be able to, you know, capture the data and send it out somewhere. Um, so one of the things that we actually do is effectively, you know, monkey patch calls to the kernel so that we can capture the data without having to instrument specific application runtimes. And we, you know, wh why do we do this and what are we interested in? So the first thing is uh, we're kind of interested in a few different things. We want to get requests in distributed systems. So things like HTTP, gRPC, database calls, along with all the associated metrics. We're interested in application level performance data, right? This is how much time is spent in your function. And then we're, you know, interested in adding dynamic instrumentation. So this is adding instrumentation after the fact, uh, where, you know, you see a problematic function and you're like, well, let me know what are these variables. Um, there is actually information available on all of these online. Uh, so please feel free to check them out. I'm actually gonna walk through an example of how protocol tracing works, just to give a little bit of a flavor of how this, this system functions. So how and where to trace the data. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on over here, but on the right side is a very simple application stack where if you think about it, all the way on the bottom is a network driver, there's stuff to work with the network interface, there's a Linux API, and then there's the actual HTTP library and the application. Um, if you think about where you want to trace network data or uh, information about HTTP, for example, you could potentially trace it at many, many different points over here. Um, and there are different trade-offs associated based on where you trace, trace uh, uh, the data. Um, there's kind of a high-level comparison of the approach. So one approach is to actually just trace a library. So if you're in Go, for example, you can create this trace a Go HTTP library. Um, actually a relatively good approach, but it is susceptible to uh, uh, changes in the Go library. You could also trace uh, at the kernel, which is actually called kernel probe. So for example, you could trace all the never calls or, or all the read and uh, write calls that happen to the, the Linux kernel, but then you end up with, you know, the protocol is not being um, understood and you'll have to reparse the protocol. Uh, and it might not work for cases where data is being encrypted in the application uh, user space. Uh, then there is like actually just capturing the network data, but uh, that tends to be, you know, a little overhead to trace, but can actually be pretty high overhead and a lot of work to actually put all the packets back together. Um, so partly what we do at Pixie is we usually focus our tracing on the first two layers where either it's on U probes or on K probes. So, I've been talking a lot about this thing called eBPF, um, and I, I don't really want to go into the, the gory details of how eBPF works, but uh, eBPF is the uh, enhanced Berkeley packet filter. Um, it was originally used as a replacement for IP tables to be able to, uh, you know, control how network traffic gets, you know, either accepted or rejected. Um, it has since significantly outgrown its name, I'd say. Um, at this point, you can think about it as a um, sandbox virtual machine that runs inside of the Linux kernel that allows you to access or safely access data structures and functions within the kernel uh, while providing the guarantee that you won't damage the Linux kernel and its functionality. And it does this by basically verifying all the code that you send over and making sure that it can be safely executed in the kernel space. So roughly the steps are you generate BPF code, you load it in the kernel, the kernel, the kernel will verify that it's not gonna break anything and then you can capture data from all these various probes and then write them to buffers. So very high level, high level overview, but that's approximately how BPF works. Uh, one of the advantages of BPF is that, you know, the sound first, first slide I mentioned, the more, you know, if you want low overhead, BPF is a great option, is that we can actually trace applications which do any non-trivial amount of work with, you know, less than two to 5% overhead. Um, so the bottom over here is the work performed per request. And I think this is in, in microseconds. I don't know what that's all labeled. And then how much performance loss we have. And you can see that as long as you have a non-trivial server, the overhead is, is basically trivial. Um, so the way it works is our data collector part, 
you know, a, a C++ program that goes and, and uses several of these libraries um, called BCC and BP uptrace to actually enable eBP uptracing. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are restrictions to what kernels it can run on. Uh, this is a relatively new feature in the kernel space. It's only been out for a few years. Um, and that means that we do have some minimums of what kernels can, can get supported. So with that, you know, I'll quickly walk through an example of how, um, how we do this with uh, a specific application. So we have the Linux kernel here. There's a whole bunch of system calls and an application that's running on it. The way the application works is that it sits on top of the Linux kernel's API, which is effectively the system calls. Right? And what we do on the other side is that we basically capture data on certain system calls using these things called BPF probes. The same thing I mentioned earlier, these small little BPF programs. And then we you know, essentially capture the data, set up the probes, record all the metadata. We have protocol inference rules. So we set, set over a bunch of like semi-leaky inference rules. Um, and you know, there are details on how this works uh, online if you're interested um, to try to classify some of the traffic. And then we process it and track all these connections over time. Um, so you know, obviously, you know, a lot of the, the general approach is, is great. Uh, the, the devil's really in the details over here. Um, things about dealing with HTTP2 and encrypted traffic, uh, these can all be like challenges. But the good news is that a lot of these challenges can be overcome. And from a user perspective, after you get these things deployed, all the tracing and everything kind of works like automatically without them having to do any work. So, you know, now that we kind of understand how Pixie's data capture system works and at like a very high level overview, how do we actually make use of this fire, fire hose of data that we capture? So for that, we have this programmable API, which is one of our, our key tenets of Pixie that allows you to, um, you know, both query and collect the data. And one of our main driving principles of this is that we did not want to invent a new language. So we actually essentially have uh, a Python dialect inside of Pixie, uh, which pretty much looks like pandas with the exception that our, we call it PX instead of PD, but the syntax and everything if you're used to pandas data processing is pretty similar uh, and it's Python, uh, it's a Pythonic language. Um, so it's an embedded DSL, it's valid Python, valid pandas, um, and the entire goal over here is it's built for a data science and machine learning. Uh, in addition, it's a data flow language, which automatically distributes all the computer machine learning workloads to the edge nodes without having, without having the actual pixel program writer understand how the, the data is distributed. Um, so, you know, it, a lot of people here are probably familiar with how data flow languages work, but it's basically a set of operators where data moves through. Um, pixel specifies a logical flow of data, so it's declarative but then Pixie's uh, runtime actually plans and optimizes the execution. Um, so in terms of transformations, uh, transformations uh, are just methods on data frames. So you can do aggregate joins, filters, and, and pretty much most um, data processing things, um, including things like machine learning. Pixie can run like TensorFlow models and, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, and everything is declarative and functional with no implicit side effects. Um, uh, so which means that functions themselves are, are completely composable. So you can actually build up pretty complicated or, or you know, pretty feature filled workflows. Um, here's an example of something that a pixel script can do. Um, obviously this requires some augmentation in the data system, but this thing over here says, you know, capture stack traces uh, and then take the stack traces and then grab things of the namespace and pod. Uh, do some filtering and then do some group buys and then generate a stack trace. Um, and then we can generate visualizations for those things. Um, so at a high level, Pixie or Pixel provides an interface to work with data. Uh, it allows us to construct you know, powerful composable workflows. And you know, in this talk, we'll actually take a look at an example of how we can use this to do some you know, what we call data science for infrastructure. Um, we'll particularly look at doing an auto scaling deployment uh, by using HTTP request throughput as an example over here, but you can go check out examples of, you know, alerting when you suspect that there's a SQL injection attack occurring in your system uh, and other things like that online. Uh, I had a link on here, check out the, the block for more examples. So. I think I've talked a lot. Uh, I guess I'm gonna be talking for a little bit longer, but um, we're gonna jump into a couple of demos. 
which will hopefully be interesting. And then uh, we can have a discussion on this. So the first demo is, uh, you know, just getting things deployed. Um, I recorded the video because you probably don't want to watch it for too long. But in order to deploy Pixie, you basically type in PX deploy. Since we don't actually need to instrument any of the runtimes manually, once Pixie gets deployed on your uh, Kubernetes cluster, everything is instantly available. Um, it takes about, you know, five minutes or less for things to get deployed and pass all the health checks. And once it's deployed, uh, we can jump to our next demo, which is the walkthrough. So I'll do a quick walkthrough of Pixie just to give a flavor of what Pixie looks like and kind of how we encompass our, our key building principles here. Um, so I have a demo cluster pulled up over here. And you know the first thing you'll see is this thing that we call a service map, which actually shows you how different services are interacting. Um, and without making any changes to the code, you can get all the you know visibility into what the latencies are, what the error rates are, and everything inside your application. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Oops, sorry, I zoomed in the wrong spot. Um, scroll down. So I'm going to do something like just jump into a specific namespace. So let's take a look at this distributed application called Online Boutique. It's a it's an application out of out of Google uh, that you know it's like a demo application. So we show you the list, uh, basically show you the graph of all the applications in here. Um, we can see what services are running. So for example, you know, just check out check out services. There seem to be some slow requests going on. Um, we can see over here that what the request throughput is, what the latencies are. There are definitely some slow requests. Um, if you go over here, there's actually a sample of all the slow requests that we're seeing. Uh, I can expand this and it actually gives you the full body of the request. You can get the request body, uh, the response status and all the addresses. And remember this is done without actually, you know, adding any instrumentation to your code. Um, and you can also do things like, well, I wonder if my application is actually running slow and their performance bottleneck. So if you click on the actual pod that's hosting this, um, you can go through this and, you know, get information about the service, but you can also get function level visibility. Um, so part of the cool thing is, you know, with eBPF, you can actually capture pretty detailed stack information about where time is being spent uh, with relatively little overhead. Uh, I think it's around like 0.2 to 0.3% overhead to be continuously capturing all of this uh, stack trace information. And uh, just to kind of show how this is all built behind the scenes, um, everything uh, inside of Pixie is a script. So even our UI is actually just rendered by a bunch of scripts, uh, which means that everything is like fully programmable um, in the Python dialect. Um, I'll just quickly switch over to a simpler script just so you can see what that looks like. So let me go to HTTP data, which just dumps out all the HTTP data it's seen in the cluster over the last few minutes, limited to a thousand records. Um, and you can see we get full visibility into the HTTP record. And um, uh, I guess the script is, is getting more and more complicated these days, but uh, it's pretty simple as like select HTTP events and then it's adding some contextual information and then some filtering and a head query. Um, but, you know, like I said, even our UI is just a combination of uh, this Pythonic pixel script and a, a JSON file that specifies how to visualize the data uh, if there isn't a trivial visualization available for it. Um, anyways, uh, feel free to check this out and see what kind of data we have. Uh, but I'll move on with the second part of the demo. Um, sorry, which is this one right here, uh, which is auto scaling deployment by HTTP request throughput. So, what is what does this mean? So, let's say you have a, an application deployed on a on a Kubernetes cluster that that can scale across many nodes. Um, it means that you know, you want to be able to provision resources for these for these applicant for the application based on the amount of requests it's serving or based on some other criteria. Uh, what typically happens is that you can scale by things like CPU or memory usage. You can scale by request latencies. You can scale by things like the latency of downstream dependencies or number of outbound connections. Uh, or you can use application specific metrics. Um, and there are probably many more things you can actually do. Uh, so in Kubernetes, the way this works is that they have this auto scaler, 
uh, which allows for what they call a horizontal and vertical auto scaling. And really what that means is do I want to give, do I want to create more, uh, more instances of this, of this pod, which is basically the entity that's serving the traffic, or do I want to create like, you know, bigger instances with more CPU and memory. Um, and within Kubernetes, you can scale based on the CPU memory, uh, but they have this thing called a custom metrics API. So you can actually scale it based on custom metrics. And we'll actually use that to uh, uh, scale pods based on metrics generated from Pixie. So here's a very, uh, you know, very complex demo app. It's just a function that prints out hello. Um, it's, a, it's a very simple Go program, right? You hit any endpoint, it'll basically print out hello. Um, and we'll use that to, to demo how this auto scaling would work. And the custom metrics is, is from this GitHub repo. Please feel free to check it out. And we also run HTTP load testing using, using Hey from, from Yana. So we pre-recorded this uh, since it's a little bit safer to do it this way. Um, but on the left, you'll see over here is uh, the service being deployed. It's running one pod. Uh, and this is K9, which is a Kubernetes uh, UI that I really recommend you check out if you use Kubernetes. And then, um, you know, it says the pods will use Pixie's HTTP request per second metric. So now if you kick off Hey, which actually adds a bunch of load to the service, and then you go back to K9s, oh, we can wait for the request to complete, go back to K9s. Uh, nothing, nothing happens over here because they're, they're not enough uh, requests. So let's go and kick off more. Cool. Okay, so now that more requests are being kicked off, we basically see they add uh, the number of pods is increasing. And after the request calm down, you'll see that the pods will go and decrease again. Um, and all of this is basically done using this very simple pixel script uh, that basically provides a new, uh, new metric for Kubernetes to use. Um, all this code is available online for you to check out. But the general idea over here is that you can basically create any metrics provider from a system like this, produce the metrics from a pixel script, and then use that to control entire pieces of infrastructure. So what we learned over here, so with that, you know, we noticed that we can collect raw data, transform the data into a signal. Uh, for example, in this case, it was HTTP request by pod. And then we can do something based on that signal, which is auto scale the number of pods um, by the request per second in HTTP. So with that, you know, I kind of wanted to, uh, I think I'm uh, almost out of time here. So I wanted to summarize, Pixie provides, you know, a rich data processing system on top of automatically collected machine data um, and we utilize things like edge processing and machine learning to make use of this large quantity of data. And, you know, for us particularly efficient processing is actually very important uh, since monitoring is typically considered overhead, right? Like nobody, nobody wants their monitoring systems use 50% of their, their resources. Um, so we're very cautious when it comes to how much, how, how many resources we allocate to, uh, to, to this workload. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about some future work and, you know, we we're completely open source, so we'd love to collaborate. Uh, there are more things to think about over here. Um, you know, in particular, we're looking at extending Pixie's machine learning capabilities. So we want to add in things like more training loops, especially with our collector system uh, to be a lot of customization of all these models that we deploy. Um, some of these could be actually useful in the, the next sentence I put in there is build models for things like security. So detecting SQL injection attacks or cross-site scripting attacks, and we could actually build models to learn from that. Um, and then we want to work on improving data processing performance that we have in our system at scales of like tens of thousands of nodes. Um, and that's something that we are working towards. Uh, we're also uh, looking at other things um, on how to make this data more useful. So one of the things uh, that I've been looking at or our team's been looking at with Balaji's team is how do we uh, use you know, accurate clocks and times to synchronize information between multiple nodes. So like you know, figure out what the actual network latencies of packets are or to actually align traces and distributed tracing. Um, and then we're always trying to expand data capture capabilities of Pixie 
uh, which involves adding stuff to our own eBPF based collector, but also being able to utilize other collectors that are available. And you know, with that, I wanted to just leave a few, uh, few things to check out. There is our GitHub repo to check out information on GitHub. And then, you know, there is a, there is a bunch of uh, cool information, I think, on our blogs um, that you can check out and then our website. And again, thanks everyone for listening and I look forward to, uh, to any questions. Cool. Thanks so much, Zane. Uh, so a reminder to our audience, uh, remember you can send in questions. Uh, I think I just saw one come in, which is great. Um, and we'll aggregate them and, and ask them um, to, to Zane during this uh, live podcast portion. Uh, so just to get us started, I actually saw a question in the audience that got me thinking a bit. Um, and the question was about uh, kind of what are the use cases that motivated you to start looking into Pixie, start the, this company, start building the system? Um, cause it's, uh, it, it's, it's really fascinating work. It's really cool and seems a little bit, um, uh, a little bit askew from what, what you might imagine most ML people are working on. Um, so I was kind of just curious, like what problems did you see kind of maybe in your everyday life or your, uh, in your workflows that kind of inspired you to, to get started down this path? Yeah. So that, that's kind of interesting. Um, so you know, for context, before I was working on Pixie, uh, I was working on computer vision stuff like Google, right? So it was a very, very different area. Uh, and before that, I was working on, you know, Spark and Hadoop stuff with uh, scaling machine learning and data pipelines at Trifecta. So partly what happened was I was, you know, a uh, co-founder and I, we were thinking about building a startup and what we should be doing. Um, and one of the things I realized is that when we were building all these at scale machine learning stuff like Google, there was all this infrastructure that helped us really debug and understand distributed systems. And, you know, that just wasn't available outside for various reasons, right? So one aspect that's not available is just the, the rich coverage of data, which is why we built all this automatic data capture stuff. And then the other aspect is just, you know, there was very little ability to like actually script and, and work with this data while you know, if you think about machine generated data, there's so much of it and so much of it can easily be generated. And a lot of it can be very high quality if you, if you do the right captures. So it was really like, I was wanting to build a machine learning data system that ultimately landed us into the space of actually solving, uh, solving the set of problems. Yeah, that, that's really, really cool. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions in the audience kind of about the, the startup, uh, your startup journey. So I, figured uh, while we're on the topic may as well fire those out so um but both from somebody named Wizran. um but they're they're wondering you know how did you validate how many people had the problems that you were seeing um and also just how did you meet your co-founder um while i'm at it uh, adrian in the audience says looks cool as hell and gives you a little dab emoji so really great work oh, thanks <laughs> thank you um so how do how do i meet my co-founder so is sean uh Bukherji, who's a co-founder uh, of Pixie, uh, we kind of go, go way, way back. Like we were in the same data space for a while. So we knew of each other. Um, Sean actually used to be in Chris Ray's, I think first startup Lattice, uh, where I, excuse me, were, was chatting with both Sean and, and Chris about a role at Lattice for, for a while. So, and I just kept in touch more and more with Sean. And we just, you know, after I left Google, uh, we connected up together and started thinking about a startup. Um, in terms of how do we validate the idea, you know, there's like, there's always a balance between trying to validate the idea and also having a vision of where things want to land up. So, you know, it, in some ways it's very similar to like, I think the scientific process, right? You have like a hypothesis of what you think you want to build or how that's going to get solved. And really you have to go talk to lots of people who have problems in the space um, to be able to understand, is this something that'll be useful, right? So like, you know, we went and talked to a bunch of people about like, okay, well, we understand that data capture is a problem. Like if you could improve this process, like how valuable would this be, right? And ultimately we realized that getting data into a lot of systems and limited visibility is actually a huge problem. Um, it's, it seems like, you know, it shouldn't be a problem because while well, we can go install all these agents and add all this manual instrumentation everywhere. Um, so it's kind of, some ways you could say it's a solved problem, but the issue is like organizational problems in large companies where you have like a hundred people who can't, you know, all go in and add instrumentation at the same time actually makes it makes it challenging to, to function. Cool. Really, really interesting story there. 
actually, you know, this resonates a lot also with me, Zane, because, you know, uh, I'm on, on the, a similar path right now to what, where you were like a couple of years ago with Michelle. So, you know, that resonates a lot. That, thanks for sharing your experience there. It's super cool. Um, actually, yeah. I wanted, wanted to try to switch gears a little bit. I'm actually, uh, I'm curious of like the uh, more machine learning aspects. Uh, in particular, what I'm super curious about, because I don't know much about the space, I kind of have the hypothesis, but I'm curious, like, what are the tasks that you believe are most interesting to do with the data that is collected by a tool like Pixie on both at the, you know, system call level or at the uh, HTTP level, uh, whatever level in the stack it is, really curious of the task that you've seen people doing and what people have not done that you think could be really interesting. Yeah, so I, I think there's, what machine learning is to be done is really dependent on what are the specific use cases. So one area where we're doing a lot of machine learning actually like on security, right? So it's things like, um, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't do this in the demo today. There's actually a blog on this, which I can share out, uh, is on detecting a SQL injection attack. It's, you know, a lot of frameworks guard against doing SQL injection attacks. And, you know, if, for anyone in the audience not familiar with SQL injection, it's when someone crafts like a specific input where it can effectively change the SQL query that's getting executed uh, on your system. Um, but, you know, a lot of times like people find SQL injection attacks using like regular expressions and that's, that's how, how you determine their SQL injection attacks happening. Uh, but it's also an area where you can train models to look across lots of queries and figure out that there is a SQL injection attack happening. So that's like one area where, where you can build, build models. Um, the other area where we spend some time is on doing schema learning, right? So we actually see a bunch of requests go by you have no idea what the actual schema of the messages are, but you want to figure out what the schema should be or what the schema has been. And then if you actually see something break, you can say, well, the system broke, but you also added like these three new fields or you decided not to send this one field, right? So you can actually detect like malform uh, API requests or you can detect um, uh, evolving APIs where things are actually breaking. Um, and it also has an added benefit where if you can learn the schema, you can use that information to compress the data and store it more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's kind of like a double win, right? Like not only can it actually improve the use case, but it can also help you do more efficient storage. Mm -hmm. No, that's super fascinating also, because again, for me, it's a new it's a space that, you know, I have not spent a lot of time thinking about. In particular, you know, the first, the first one that you, you mentioned, the SQL injection seems very interesting, in particular, because... Um, I can imagine that, um, you know, some information about the SQL injection can come from the, you know, content of the query itself, obviously, you know, it, it is a SQL exactly. injection or not, but also I can imagine that there could be other additional contextual data that comes from, like, who is that is sending this, this, this you know, um, um, the, this query or other, other contextual information about the, where the query is sent before that, you know, could make it for like a potentially rich multi-model kind of task, right? Uh, right. So it, it's, it's super fascinating to me. And this is like making my, my, my wheel spin a little bit because, you know, uh, one of the main um, uh, selling points, if you want, of a system like Ludwig, which is this open source system that I worked on for training model in a declarative way, is actually the capability of working with uh, multi-model data uh, very easily in a declarative sense. So I know I'm just thinking that you know there could be something that we could do together. Also because you know being both projects under the Umbrella Linux Foundation, that sounds like a match made in heaven. But awesome, yeah. I mean, part of the reason we started working on this space is because we realized there's so much interesting machine learning work to do, mm -hmm. um, and it's an area that a lot of machine learning research doesn't happen in, probably right. because it's hard to get a lot of production. You know thousand node clusters in academic settings or, or other research settings. Um, actually, to talk about some of the machine learning stuff, I, I shared a blog post in the chat on Zoom. I don't know how that, that works out. Uh, that's actually a blog post we wrote on TensorFlow about how to leverage machine to um, like do unstructured learning uh, for extracting information out of like HTTP messages. So that's that's another area of how, how this works. That's perfect. Thank you very much for sharing it. Yeah. Um, other, other use cases are things like data loss prevention, right, which is if there's an external API call, you want to make sure that you're not sending more sensitive information. That's actually another good use of like machine learning to figure out, oh, is there like PII here? Like what's going on? Are you allowed to send PII to some like random IP address somewhere? Um, so lots of lots of fun use cases. Amazing. Thank you very much. Zane, I'd love to give you a chance to talk about some of the challenges you expect to have to solve when you do scale to, you know, large clusters with tens of thousands of machines. Um, and in particular, uh, I know like 
modern clusters these days are quite diverse in terms of the hardware um, yep. that they're composed of. Uh, and I'm curious about you know what what might be hard about uh, you know increasing the scope of Pixie to something like a new accelerator or a new type of hardware or something like that. What, what's that process like? What makes that uh, challenging? Yeah. So the biggest challenge that we have for the data collection side of Pixie requires a UTF, which uh, doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. So um, one example of this is even not an accelerator, but you know we're trying to get Pixie to work on Graviton machines uh, from AWS, which is an ARM architecture. Things should be mostly fine, and most of Pixie will work just fine. But you know our data collector does you know depend on information about the the CABI, which is different on ARM architecture than it is on on you know, x86. Um, so things like that, that, you know, will add adds a little bit of complexity to our, our system when we port. And then a lot of accelerators aren't even running, you know, they're not even be running a proper version or even Linux at all. Uh, so that's that's a challenge. Um, good news is a lot of accelerators usually attach to a proper Linux machine. So you can actually probably instrument it using that means, uh, but we haven't tried that yet. And just in terms of, you know, suppose, they're all Linux machines and you're scaling to something like 10,000, 100,000 nodes. Um, what are the kind of things you expect to encounter the, you know, what kind of challenges you need to solve there? Yeah, interestingly, some of the biggest challenges we've had when we've scaled at tens of thousands of nodes, I'd say they're in a couple, actually a couple of different camps. One of the camps is just capturing all the metadata from Kubernetes about all the information changing and making sure that we haven't lost anything has been a bigger challenge than we thought it would be. Um, partly because there is an outage of the Kubernetes API, we want to make sure that we keep functioning. We also want to make sure we don't tank the Kubernetes API. Uh, there was an interesting blog post, I think, from a couple of years ago from, from OpenAI, where they, did talk, where they deployed some other monitoring service and it actually tanked their Kubernetes cluster to the point where they couldn't even kube control, uh, delete their pod because it introduced so much load to their metadata system that it stopped Kubernetes from functioning. Right, so it's stuff like that where we want to be able to capture all of the data. We want it to be fast and you know available immediately, but we also want to make sure that we don't overload the system. Uh, then there is the other side, which is you know we are planning scripts and queries to execute on thousands of nodes, and we have to do that pretty efficiently, right? Like even most distributed databases don't run on like ten thousand nodes. Um, but with Pixie, that's effectively what you have, right? Because every every node is like a mini database, and then the collectors have the more global view. So we do have to plan and execute queries at a pretty large scale. I wanted to take a moment to ask a couple of the questions from the audience uh, on YouTube. Um, I'll start with one uh, asked by Adrian um, and plus one by Sanjeev. Uh, so have you thought about uh, in terms of uh, kind of monitoring for ML applications, um, things like uh, live drift of data requests or uh, data model drift, um, things like that. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, so actually, um, I work on a bunch of research in my role at Stanford, and I'm working on this project called ML X-Ray with Hang and uh, Sachin, uh, which is on trying to monitor machine learning models. And we've actually just started using like the data system of Pixie to expand it to do alerting on machine learning models. Uh, happy to share that information. Uh, actually, I can probably find you the, the early paper for it on archive. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, I'm sure some somebody in the audience will be able to uh, f find that for us. Um, I guess while you're while you're looking for that, and I, I saw that you just posted in the Zoom link, so so we'll send that to the chat. Um, uh, another question from the audience, uh, it, it was interesting that you were talking about, you know, monitoring systems that can crash Kubernetes. Uh, do you think it makes sense to extend Pixie to frameworks beyond Kubernetes? Um, uh, so Adrian in the chat, uh, uh suggests like Metaflow, for example, which I, I think is uh, a system that Matei talked about back in episode one of the series. Yeah, I think there's actually nothing fundamental about Pixie that actually requires Kubernetes. It's all very pluggable. Like we have a metadata provider which provides a Kubernetes metadata. Then there's like a context provider where you can put in things like pods and whatever, right? So it's all like pretty modularized. Uh, part of the reason that we focus so hard on Kubernetes, one is because CNCF is very Kubernetes centric. 
And the other side of it is just because, you know, adding more frameworks just introduces a lot more like testing overhead and surface area for us. So it's a little bit more uh, selfish than anything else. Um, but, you know, if other folks are interested in supporting other platforms, we'd be happy to, to work with them to, to do that. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, that actually makes me think of something else I was talking about during your talk, which was uh, it's it's really clear that um, you know when when you're building Pixie, there there was a lot of ML expertise, but there was also a lot of really really deep systems expertise. Um, and I'm just curious, yeah. as you know, that as you know, we're all kind of interested in this intersection of ML and systems. What would advice would you kind of give to someone who's looking to develop kind of dual sets of these? Uh, both both of these sets of expertise and in such a deep way as I think you guys at, at, at Pixie have been able to do over the past few years. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, you know, as part of Pixie, you know, we have, it's not a very large team, we're like 12 people, but, um, you know, we have enough expertise spread across the areas, uh, across the different areas across our team. So that's very helpful. Um, I think the rest of it is also just keeping a very open mind. Like, I think I mentioned this earlier, right? Like I actually started off, um, you know, when I when I was a grad student at Stanford, I actually used to work on hardware design. Um, so Mark Horowitz was my PhD advisor, and you know, the first thing I worked on at Stanford was building chips. Um, so I had like very very like deep deep hardware expertise, like transistor level hardware. Um, and I started working on like GPU architecture and stuff uh, later on, and my during my later years of my grad school. Um, and I was working at NVIDIA on like architecture stuff. And part of the reason I actually moved into the data space was because I spent so much time working with data uh, and building models. So I was like working on applying some machine learning to optimize uh, GPU energy efficiency stuff that I'm like, oh, this is like really cool. Like, you know, I'm getting to learn a bunch of data and machine learning stuff. And I kind of just evolve into that area. Uh, so I think, you know, if you have like strong fundamentals in one area, it's, you know, I don't think it's that difficult to start learning new things and moving into the other areas. Were there any lessons that you found particularly interesting as you kind of jumped from those areas, you know, both from PhD to industry to, to startup land, or as you jumped from hardware to data to, um, to I, I think you mentioned you also had some, you know, machine learning uh, research yeah. positions? Yeah. So one of the things, you know, at least for me, I'm, I'm kind of a systems person, but even on the machine learning side, I still consider myself a systems person. So I always think about like, what are the, the first principles systems thinking? And that's kind of been like the guiding principles. And I, I, I feel that way when you build a company too, right? And in some ways, um, you know, when you're building a company, you're trying to engineer a system that will build a product that you want, right? So it's just like, they're all kind of the same type of problem, right? You're trying to figure out like, how do you actually engineer the system? And it's just the system being engineered is slightly different. Um, and you know, for me, like doing first principles thinking of what we want to build, why do we want to build it was a very important aspect of it. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I, I really, you know, empathize with that, you know, systems mind as well. I, you know, personally identify with that. Um, one of my advisors, Kayvon, uh, he's, you know, classically a graphics yeah. researcher, but, but also um, describes himself like the first sentence. He's like, I'm a systems mind who, who also loves graphics. Um, and, and computer graphics. So, so that's, that's really interesting. Yep. Um, yeah, it's kind of the way I, I think about it too. It's like, I'm a systems person who likes to work with, you know, computer vision stuff or embedded systems or, or whatever. It is like, how do we actually solve the systems issues? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I love also thinking about those like broader, like cross cutting issues. Like you're not just looking at one algorithm or one uh, model, but you know, the, the cross cutting issues um, yep. from like, like I think, in slide two of your presentation from like, you know, data collection to, to all these other things. Um, speaking of which, what topics do you think are kind of underemphasized in ML research or ML sys research these days? I know you mentioned that there's a lot of focus placed on the model part, um, but what other things do you think are, you know, maybe falling by the wayside um, because of that overemphasis on kind of this one step in the pipeline? Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of these things have like, some, you know, I think it's all changing and there's more and more stuff around this, but I really think like model lifecycle management, like deployment and like, especially, you know, a lot of times, like we think about models as being static, right? Like, oh, you built this model. Now we achieved this level of efficiency. The, the world actually is like constantly evolving and changing. So like 
accounting for drift and, and things like that, especially in like real world statistics is, is an interesting problem that I think people are starting to look at, but I still don't think it, it holds the same level of weight as, you know, building new architectures or getting better efficiency at certain data sets. Um, that I have the deployment side. Um, and I think, you know, an area that's you know, personally important to me is just like embedded machine learning, I think still doesn't get nearly as much attention as it as it needs to get over the next you know few years. What do you think are kind of the core problems there? I know we were talking a little bit about um, kind of before um, about this class that you're teaching at Stanford. Could you talk a little bit about you know what's really exciting for you there? Um, what what can we expect to see kind of the next few years? Yeah, so I think part of the reason that a lot of embedded machine learning actually doesn't get a lot of attention is a lot of the core problems are actually very similar, right? It's like oh, how do you build smaller, faster models, right? It's like, it's relevant to everybody. Uh, but interesting things happen when you start going to like tiny ML scale where you're like, my model now needs to be a hundred kilobytes, right? But you're not just talking about a smaller model. You're talking about a model that's like orders of magnitude smaller than most <laughs> models that people, people use. Um, so I think there is a big paradigm shift, even though it's like similar things, like you're doing quantization, building smaller models, whatever it is, there is a shift when you have to move like a, 10 kilobyte model or 100 kilobyte model. Um, there's also another level of shift when you start thinking about running, you know, tiny machine learning models with ambient energy, right? Where you don't actually have batteries or you have batteries that need to last for years because they're deployed on some sensor somewhere. Um, and I think those are the, the areas that they're, they're kind of this big overlap between systems and machine learning, but in like the, the embedded systems of machine learning domain. Yeah, that that's really really cool. Um, I think uh, Piero, do do you have a question? Yeah, actually, I was you know curious on the you know this um, um, side angle of like hundred kilobytes model make made also my my wheel spin a little bit, which is um, you know this is true in many uh, in many let's say engineering um, industries if you want or in, in engineering um, specialties that you know constraints are what usually makes it so that um, uh, people have to come up with new solutions. So I'm actually curious if you believe that then solutions that we um, will come up with for addressing these smaller scale issues and embedded systems that are more constrained will then percolate and be applied also at the higher higher scale. And um, if that will can, can become like um, foundations for, for, for like improved systems at any other scale also. Yeah, I, I think they will. Like, you know, if you go back to like, I used to work on graphics stuff before I had NVIDIA, like I mentioned when I was in hardware stuff, you'll actually see a lot of the techniques that people use for building, you know, graphics chips on low power devices actually percolated up to, to desktop GPUs as they learn to better adapt them for, for high performance systems. So I, I think in some ways it's, it's a two way street. It's just that it takes time because the two groups of people working on them are tend to be very, coming from very different sides. Yeah, that, that's really interesting how even within a community, you can have kind of different people um, kind yeah. of uh, coming up with the different ideas. Um, I think we're, we're reaching the, the end of the hour. So I just wanted to, to plug in one more question from the audience, um, which is how does it work for Pixie to be based in the Bay Area, um, but uh, kind of acquired and working in a company now that is uh, whose center of gravity is now in Portland? Um, I think referring to Pixie and New, New Relic there. Yeah, so you know, one note is that Pixie is relatively or rather pretty much completely independent within New Relic. Um, we still have like our own offices. I report uh, directly up to the CEO. Um, and you know, we pretty much run the, the foundation open source and Pixie arm of New Relic's um, of New Relic. And uh, New Relic also right now is more and more distributed. So even though the center of gravity might be in Portland, they're a pretty distributed company. Um, and it hasn't really been an issue for us, especially with, you know, COVID ends up happening. Everyone's kind of adapted to being in this remote first, maybe remote first or semi first world. Um, and it hasn't really been, been an issue so far. Cool. Um, well, I, I hope that that answers your, your question in the YouTube audience, Sanjeev. Um, with that, I think we'll call it for, for the YouTube portion. Um, this week. So thank you again, Zane, for, for agreeing to come on our, uh, on the, on the show and, and give a talk. We, we really enjoyed it, learned a lot. Um, thanks to the audience. We, we had a lively conversation about, you know, technical questions, startup questions, um, everything in between. Um, so, so that, that was certainly a lot of fun.
Um, as always, you can uh, check out our website, mlsys.stanford.edu, to look at our schedule, um, see what talks are coming up. Uh, we have a mailing list on there, so you can subscribe to the mailing list. I think we email you something like twice a week, so, so no spam, we promise. Um, remember to hit that like button, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get notified when we go live. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube VOD after, after the fact, then, you know, leave a comment about your favorite part of, of today's video. Um, and join us again next week. We've got, uh, Mosharov Chowdhury from, uh, the University of Michigan. Um, so we'll have a very, very exciting talk there. Um, two and weeks with from now. two weeks from now, two weeks from now, next week is Thanksgiving. Um, th thank you for your order. Uh, yeah. So, so join us two weeks from now. Um, and we'll have an, an exciting talk from, from Mosharov, Mosharov Chowdhury. Um, and with that, we will uh, wave goodbye.